Good evening again. I hope you enjoyed taking a look at the campus and meeting the students here at ITE College Central. I brought the rally to ITE for a serious purpose, to underscore my long-standing commitment to investing in every person, every Singaporean, to his full potential, but also to signal a change, to emphasize that this is not the usual NDR. Singapore is at a turning point. Tonight, I'll talk about the challenges which we face and what we must do to change, to respond to these challenges in this new phase of our development and nation building. Last year, I spoke about the essential elements of our future, hope, heart, and home. And since then, we've been holding the one, our Singapore conversation, OSC, on building a better Singapore. The OSC took a fresh approach to engage Singaporeans. It had no preset agenda, it was a fully open discussion, and it elicited a very positive response. Nearly 50,000 people participated, and diverse groups. We had elderly residents meeting at the Yuhua Hawker Centre. Grace, Grace Fu brought them in, and they had the discussion in dialects. I think they had the time of their lives and also appreciated being heard. We had the arts and the culture community expressing their point of view. We had school children drawing pictures of what they aspired to see when they grew up one day. They shared what heart, hope and home meant to them. But they also expressed what they wanted to see in Singapore. First of all, opportunities. Opportunities to lead fulfilling lives, to realise one's potential. Secondly, purpose, coming together to build a better Singapore. Thirdly, assurance, assurance that our basic needs can be met, that we don't have to face life's uncertainties alone. Fourth, community spirit, closer community ties, stronger social cohesion, a warmer kampong spirit. And finally and fifthly, Trust. Trust between the government and the people. Trust among Singaporeans. And these themes were summarised in the OSC exhibition, which I hope you had a look at outside this auditorium. I had tea recently with the OSC committee members, the facilitators, the volunteers, to thank them for what they were doing. And I asked them what was their biggest takeaway from this exercise. And they said, the spirit of openness Participants realising that others had different, even conflicting views, and these views had to be reconciled, respected, and we had to find a way forward, consensus where possible, sometimes agree to disagree. So the OSC has been a very meaningful exercise. We've listened to one another. We've created a firmer, shared basis to discuss and to plan our future. And I'd like to thank the OSC members committee members, the facilitators, the volunteers and the participants for all the work which they've done. Thank you very much. <laughs> to achieve our aspirations, we need to take into account the world around us. This is a time of rapid change and uncertainty. I've discussed these themes before many times, so tonight, I'd just like briefly to share with you a few striking facts about technology, about globalisation, about competition, income inequalities. Technology is transforming our lives. Even tonight, as I'm talking to you, more than a few of you are taking pictures, tweeting, Facebooking, Instagramming. <laughs> Real time. But it's not just social media. We have 3D printing, a machine which can print spare parts, print models, print toys, print pistols, print body parts, organs, print things which can make a difference to our lives, medical devices. And we have been doing this research. A-Star has a 3D printer which can print bone tissue scaffolds. 
And let me show you this picture. This is the printer behind. This is the monitor. And you can see the thing which he's printing. It looks like a little rectangle with two holes in it. Those are the bone tissue scaffolds. What do you use it for? If you have a tooth extraction, after the dentist has taken the tooth out, you have a hole in your gum. You put this in, it helps the bone to grow back. And you can see this one. This, has been the, this one has, is about to come in. And on the left, you can see there's one already done. So one day, a bionic person. But that's some distance off here. But we're heading in that direction. Less spectacular but equally far-reaching is robots, artificial intelligence. Programs which can do smart things which previously only human beings could do. Not just placing chips on a production line, but skilled professional jobs. Accounting, legal advice, radiology, reading x-rays. In the old days, each one was a professional job. You needed a lawyer, highly paid, or a doctor, or an accountant. Now the basic work can be delegated to a computer program. Liberating for us, a bit scary if you were doing that job before. But that is competition. Competition from technology, competition also from new emerging economies, China, India, Vietnam. China and India alone, one billion workers altogether. Every year, millions of new graduates entering the workforce. Just now in the Mandarin speech, I said seven million from China. If you add in some more from India, it's 10 million a year. All hungry, looking for work. Quite formidable. One of our young professionals who took part in an OSC dialogue in Shanghai said, I thought I could survive in China quite easily but I was wrong. He has to scramble. But fortunately, other OSC participants said that learning Mandarin in Singapore had helped them in China. They may not have enjoyed it in school or PSLE, but now that they're working, they appreciated its value and they are grateful we forced them to do it. So we are seeing competition and we are seeing income inequality rising to the top zooming away, middle class stagnating. People with exceptional skills, globally in demand, doing very well. Not just IT or financial services, but even culture or sports. Take Ronaldo, the footballer. He visited a secondary school last month, Crest Secondary School, in Singapore. He got mobbed. He has many fans in Singapore. If you go to his Facebook page, 60 million Facebook fans. Twitter, 20 million Twitter followers. In Chinese, they say, Xiao Wu Tian Da Wu. The little, little Kuching Kurap looking at this mega star. Therefore, spectacularly successful, but not. Everybody else can be as talented or as lucky as Ronaldo. So people have to work a lot harder, may not be earning a lot more, but enjoying less job security than before. So Singaporeans are affected by these global trends and feeling uncertain and anxious also. Because in Singapore too, technology and globalization are widening our income gaps. And in addition to that, we have domestic social stresses building, population aging, society becoming more stratified, less mobile. Children of successful Singaporeans more likely to do well. Children of lower income families, fewer of them rising than in previous generations. It's a reality. We acknowledge it. We have to do our best to do something about it. These trends are compounded by day-to-day -day problems cost of living, public transport, you know them as well as I do. So Singaporeans sense correctly that the country is at a turning point. I understand your concerns. I promise you, you will not be facing these challenges alone because we're all in this together. We'll find a new way to thrive 
in this new environment. My colleagues and I have been pondering these problems over the past year, thinking hard about them. What principles have worked for Singapore? What changes do we have to make? How can we continue to thrive and prosper? And the OSC process and reflections have given us valuable inputs into this. They've expressed Singaporeans' views and feelings on where we stand and what we want Singapore to be. And it's given us confidence to set out a new way forward. We must make now a strategic shift in our approach to nation building. Singapore has been built on three pillars, the individual, the community, and the state. And each has played a role, complementing each other. The individual working hard, saving for himself and his family. The community getting together to help different groups of people, whether it's the unions, whether it's the VWOs, whether it's business federations, the clans, each group coming together, strengthening one another. And overall, the government, creating the conditions for a vibrant economy and for good jobs, investing heavily in our people through education, through housing, through healthcare, but keeping state welfare low and targeted, stringent. Some people call this tough love, but it's tough love which has worked well. Today, the situation has changed. If we rely too heavily on the individual, their efforts alone will not be enough, especially among the vulnerable, like the low-income families, like the elderly. And there are some things which individuals cannot do on their own, and there are other things which we can do much better together. So we must shift the balance. The community and the government will have to do more to support individuals. The community can and must take more initiative, organizing and mobilizing ourselves, solving problems, getting things done. We have to be a democracy of deeds and not a democracy of words, as Mr. S. Rajaratnam, who was one of our founding fathers, said many years ago. The government will also do more to support individuals and the community. What we used to do, we will continue to do to provide core public services, housing, education, health care. But at the same time, we will make three important shifts in our approach. First, we will do more to give every citizen a fair share in the nation's success, raise the incomes and the wealth of the low-income Singaporeans, for example, through our housing program, home ownership. Secondly, Strengthen social safety nets. Assure people that whatever happens to you, you can get the essential social services that you need, especially health care. Thirdly, do more to keep paths open upwards for all. To keep our society mobile, to bring every child to a good starting point and make sure that however Whichever family you are born to, whether you are privileged or not privileged, you are never shut out from the system, from opportunities, and especially through education. These are three strategic shifts. One, to level up people. Two, to share the risks, to make sure that whatever happens in life, you will not be alone. And three, to keep our system open, mobile, so that if you have talent, you can rise. If you work hard, you can get ahead. We will apply these shifts progressively to all our social policies. And let me tonight talk about housing and health care and education, specifically at a little bit more detail, so that you understand what we're trying to do. Singapore has succeeded because everyone has shared in the fruits of our progress. Incomes have risen across the board. The values of homes has appreciated. And even poor people are not poor by any international standard. If you take the lowest one-fifth of our households by income, the lowest one-fifth, 20% of households, 
That means about 200,000 households. Each household in this group, each poor household, has on average $200,000 of net wealth in the HDB flat. What does that mean? The household owns a flat. It may be fully paid, it may be not fully paid. If it's not fully paid, you subtract out the mortgage, which is outstanding. What is in his name is his, on average, $200,000 per household. No other society in the world has done that. We have achieved in Singapore growth with equity and spread the fruits of growth widely in Singapore. But today, maintaining equity has become harder because income distributions have widened. We are not all Ronaldos. But we do have a few who can do almost as well as Ronaldos and others along that spectrum. So the government must intervene more to keep ours a fair and a just society. In fact, we've been doing this already in recent years. It's not starting tomorrow. It has started in recent years. Workfare was a big first move. We've got permanent GST vouchers. We've got the special employment credit. Each one of these schemes institutionalized what building blocks of a more active social policy. And we will build on these programs to give those with less a better deal, so long as you too make the effort, give of your best. Housing has and will continue to be an important way to share the fruits of our progress with all Singaporeans and to level up the poor. The HDB program isn't just about a roof over our heads, it's also a valuable nest egg. But it's not just a valuable nest egg, it's also a home. A home where we sink roots, where we raise families, where we build ties, friendships, emotional ties with our fellow Singaporeans. And you can see this in any community anywhere in Singapore, but I give you as an example my Tikki residence. Look at this gentleman, Mr. Ho Ti Soon. He was a sailor all his life. He came back to Ang Mo Kio, settled down in 1978. Raised his family there. Four children, nine grandchildren. Now he even has six great-grandchildren. But he's got friends, he's got family, he's got neighbours. He chit-chats with his friends on his void deck daily. And you take a guess how old he is. He is 104. Or take Madam Puranam. She's lived in Tikki more than 25 years. She sells Indian spices at the Block 409 market. And her regular customers are her good friends. So we want to help Singaporeans own their homes, raise loving families, and build strong communities. Therefore, I believe that home ownership is still a fundamental principle for Singapore. We can talk about rentals, we need some. We can talk about other models, we may experiment. But the core of it, home ownership, 99-year lease, it's yours. In the last two years, we've moved decisively to do more to help Singaporeans to own their homes. We've built a record number of new flats, cleared the first-timer backlog. We've delinked new flat prices from the resale market, stabilised BTO prices. We've introduced a special CPF housing grant targeted for poorer households to buy two-room flats, three-room flats. We've raised the income ceilings and relieved the sandwich class. And we've allowed singles to buy BTO flats, something which they've asked for for a very long time. And we introduced the NS Recognition Award, NSRA, for NS men. It's a Hong Pao paid into the CPF accounts of the NS men, which NS men can use to buy a flat, some of it. So all these things have made flats more affordable and more accessible. But I know that Singaporeans still worry about property prices. We do surveys. It's one of the items on their minds with health care. And they ask themselves, if they are young, can I afford a flat when I get married? If they are older, can my children afford to get married 
because no flat cannot get married, or as they say in Singapore, cannot ROM. <laughs> we ask, what if I lose my job before I finish selling my flat, before I finish paying off my flat, paying off my housing loan? And so, in the OSC conversations, Singaporeans wanted home first, then asset. Ideally, of course, you want the home, you want the asset, you want it all. And one lady, one mother at a dialogue expressed this in her housing. She said she hoped her property would appreciate because it's hers and you wanted to keep its value. But then at the same time, she wanted her kids to have cheaper housing. And then she laughed because she knew that you cannot really have both. You must decide which it is going to be. So we can't deliver everything which this mother is hoping for, but we can maintain the value of HDB flats as over the years, provided Singapore remains stable and strong. And at the same time, we can keep the flats affordable for future flat buyers. And I will make sure that every Singaporean family who is working can afford an HDB flat. We can do that. What do I mean? A family today, if you are earning $1,000, you should be able to afford a two-room flat. If you're earning $2,000, you should be able to afford a three-room flat. If you're earning $4,000, you should be able to afford a four-room flat. And that is completely possible. And when I say afford, I mean use your CPF mostly and have a 25-year loan, not a 30-year loan, and then in your later years, your income can be used to beef up your retirement savings. So, 1K, two-room flat, 2K, three-room flat, 3K, 4K, four-room flat. 25-year loan, mostly from your CPF. Can be done. We are almost there. How do we do this? I don't think we want to do this by bringing down the BTO prices because that, after a while, will bring down all the resale market and everybody who owns a flat in Singapore will be hurt. But we'll keep the BTO prices stable for some time. We'll increase the support for the lower and middle income households. And we already have the mechanisms to do this, to subsidise flat purchases. I talked about the special CPF housing grant just now, SHG. We also have the additional housing grant, AHG, which extends to the middle-income families as well, lower middle-income households too. So together, low-income households and middle-income households get a big discount on two-room flat and three-room flats, sometimes more than one-third of the price in discounts. But we will do more. For families who are only able to afford two-room flats, I would say that two-room flats are already quite affordable to them. So we are happy they are able to buy the two-room flats as a reasonable cost on them every month. But what we should do is to help them when they are ready to upgrade from a two-room to a three-room flat, when they improve their lives. And we will give them some step-up grants to help them to upgrade later on. So to, from two-room, if you need to upgrade later, you get help from the government. For others buying three-room and four-room flats, the lower income, the lower middle income, first-time buyers, three-room and four-room flats, we can also do more. The three-room flats, relatively speaking, are less of an issue, is more affordable. The four-room flats is okay, but I think we can give more help to the households who are buying them. So we'll extend the special housing grant, which is now only for two- and three-room flats. We'll extend that also to four-room, and we'll also aim that a bit more broadly instead of only for the low-income households. We'll aim that also for the low- and the middle-income households. So what it means, net-net, is a middle-income household buying a four-room flat can get a saving of up to $20,000, which is not so small. $20,000 more than what they're getting today, which is already not so small. So let me explain how this works. I shall be your housing agent. 
HDB has a very beautiful development, Fernvale River Walk, a BTO project in Sengkang. It's a marvellous place, waterfront living, two-room, three-room, four-room flats, Sengkang West Avenue, Fernvale Link, Pongol Reservoir, just down there. There are going to be four residential blocks, 20 to 22 storeys high, with spaces for relaxation and bonding. So there'll be children's playgrounds, if you're young kids. There'll be adults and elderly fitness stations. You can practice for your IPPT. Resting shelters, a precinct pavilion. Open green spaces, and if you like nature, not very far away, leisure stroll along the boardwalk next to Pongol Reservoir. Hence, it's called Fernvale River Walk. And furthermore, supermarkets, eating house, shops, and a childcare centre. Everything is there. How much do you think a three-room flat in this place will cost? Cheapest. People say flats are expensive. How much do you think they will cost? Think about it. BTO price. I think I should do a poll. I'll offer you three choices. 150,000, 200,000, 250,000. So 150, 250, 150, 200, 250. Who thinks that the cheapest flat is $250,000? Hands up. Who thinks the cheapest flat is $200,000? Hands up. Wow, quite a lot. Who thinks the cheapest flat is $150,000? I think we must vote again. Two fifty dollars is out. So 150 and 200, your choice. 150, hands up. 200. I think 200 wins. But actually, 200 loses. Because the cheapest flat is just $150,000. Three rooms. Posted price. So if you add grants, add subsidies, low-income families pay even less. But people will say, ah, it's such a cheap flat. So let me take a typical flat in Fernville Riverwalk, typical three-room flat, and let me show you some sums. I'm still your HDB housing agent, remember. <laughs> but not getting any commission from Corporal One. <laughs> so a typical Fernvale three-room flat, BTO price. Let me, let me go through, show you the arithmetic, because af afterwards we've got, a, we've got a stall outside you can sign. <laughs> three-room BTO flat, typical price is a bit more than 150, but not much more, is $170,000. Okay? Now, let's assume that you are one of the $2,000 households income buying this flat. What grants are you going to get? Existing, just the present arrangements, you will have 45,000 of grants already, various things. But now, because we've changed our SHG, you will get an extra $10,000 of grant. And furthermore, if the husband is an NS man, which I think most Singaporeans will be, from the NS Recognition Award, he'll have another $4,000 worth of grant down there. So the net price to him, set buying the flat, if you have your calculators, is $111,000. Yow, yow, yow. So, those, so when you think it's $200,000, I think that may be the impression, but it is not accurate. It's actually a lot more affordable than you think. And if this household takes a 25-year mortgage, how much will the monthly repayment be? $427. So the CPF can pay all of that, cash repayment every month, 
zero. So it's not bad. It's so attractive that some people will now ask, how about a four-room flat? <laughs> so let me show you the four-room flat sums. Price, typically, I take a typical flat again, is $285,000. It's not the cheapest. The cheapest is about 250 odd, but I use a typical example. Household income for this family, let's say $4,000. Husband and wife working, not hard to achieve. Existing grants for this household, they will already have $15,000 worth of grant. But with a new scheme, with a SHG extended, they'll get 20K more. And I assume this is also an NS man, $4,000 of NS a recognition award going in towards the flat. So the net price to him is 246K, less than a quarter million. Also affordable. Now, supposing they take a mortgage, 25-year mortgage, monthly repayment, $987, from, of which the CPF will look after 920, and his cash repayment is all of $67, or about $2 a day. Not bad. And, and people say HDB is making money. Something is wrong. <laughs> this is how we are making HDB flats more affordable and especially more affordable for the less well-off Singaporeans. So we have made, let me summarize my points. We've made significant moves in recent years. Tonight, what I've announced is another significant move, but it's not the end of the story. We will monitor closely how well people can afford housing in Singapore. And over time, as it becomes necessary, we will do more to help the lower and the middle income Singaporeans own their homes. We will always make sure that an HDB flat is always within reach, affordable and available to Singaporeans. Don't worry. Go ahead, plan on it, get married, get your flat. If you make the effort, the opportunities are there in Singapore. Besides housing, we'll also give Singaporeans more assurance over life's uncertainties, especially health care. Working adults feel the pressure, taking care of growing children, also looking after elderly parents. People with chronic illnesses worry, worry about the cost of consultations, the cost of medicines maybe a few cents a day, but day after day, year after year. When you have high blood pressure, the doctor prescribes something to you, he says, please take this, please take this for the rest of your life. And you have to take it seriously. Older people worry about the medical bills which they may face and worry about the burden which they may place on their children. So we will improve healthcare financing to give Singaporeans more peace of mind. First of all, let me talk about outpatient care because that's a significant part of it. And then let me say something about inpatient care, which is actually a lesser problem, but is a, is a big worry to many Singaporeans. But first with outpatient care. One concern, which, one group which is concerned with outpatient care is those with chronic illnesses. Like Mr. Tesio Moore, who's 59 years old, has high blood pressure, and regularly visits his GP for checkups and medication. And as I said, high blood pressure, you have to take the pills for the rest of your life, and the consults and the pills price adds up. So how is he being helped? He's being helped through the CHAS scheme, Community Health Assist Scheme. He has a blue card. Every time he visits his doctor, he gets a subsidy up to $80, helps pay for the consultation, 
helps pay for his medications. It's a big saving for him. He has a blue card, his wife has a blue card, his father, his sister, they all have their cards. But he has two children, teenage, 15 and 17, and they don't have CHAS cards. Why? Because for CHAS, when we made the scheme, we set a lower limit, you have to be 40 years old before you can join the scheme to get it started. Now that the scheme is well launched, we have 300,000 people on CHAS, the system is working nicely. I think we remove this floor and younger Singaporeans will also be able to, to join the CHAS scheme, including <laughs> Mr. Tay's two children. And I think that will diminish his worry about his family's health care costs. So that's one aspect of outpatient treatment. Another aspect of outpatient treatment is SOCs, specialist outpatient clinics. When you go to the SOC at SGH or Tan Tok Seng, you get a subsidy, but for, young, for, for, for poor people, it may still add up to an expense. So we will increase the subsidies for the lower and middle income patients who are visiting specialist outpatient clinics, and we will means test these additional subsidies so that we know we can target them to the people who need them. I think this is quite a big thing. Many people have expressed their concern to me over the SOC charges. This will make a difference to them. The third big thing on outpatient treatment, but this is something which will take us some time to do, is MediSafe. There are people, many people have asked for MediSafe to be used for outpatient treatments. Most recently, Dr. Lam Pin Min chaired a committee, the GPC, put up a report. He asked, can we use MediSafe for outpatient treatments? And I think they are right, we should do this. In principle, this is sound, it's personal responsibility. I save, I use the money when I get sick. If I didn't save when I get sick, I must scramble for the cash, it's a problem. We want to move in this direction. We've already taken some steps there. You can use it for chemotherapy. You can use it for major outpatient operations. But you go there, you do the operation, you come home. But I think you can extend it further, and especially for old people, we can extend it further. We'll be studying carefully how to do this. So thank you, Pin Min, for your suggestion. So that's outpatient treatment. The other aspect of this is inpatient treatment. If we should fall seriously ill, can I afford the hospital bill if I have a very big hospital bill? In reality, there are very few such cases. I wanted to look for a good example for tonight. I scanned all of my MPS cases over the last one year. I had 140 medical cases which in itself is already not a very big number, but none of the 140 medical cases had huge hospital bills. So I asked MOH, please find me a good example. MOH scanned their database. They also found very, very few examples. So in fact, if you're on MediShield, which most people are, you don't need to worry. Can I have a show of hands? Who is not on MediShield down here? Nobody. So you're all right. Oh, you should be all right, but I know that even though I can explain this to you and you can understand what I'm saying, people still worry. And some people don't have MediShield cover and they, they could have a problem because MediShield, it reaches 92% of people, but some of the older folk may not have it. Some of the people who have pre-existing conditions may have fallen out, may not have it. So, and also there's another third group, the very old people because MediShield start, stops at the age of 90, and there are quite a number of Singaporeans who are now more than 90 years old, including Mr. Yasmudin Rasul, whom I showed you a picture of just now. He's 92. And, of course, Mr. Ho Ti Soon, who is 104. So, what will we do? I think we revamp, relaunch MediShield. We give it a new name. We call it MediShield Life. Why? Why MediShield Life? 
because it will cover you for life. If you don't stop at 90, the MediShield life will not stop at 90. So don't worry, it will cover old people. Secondly, MediShield life will be universal. It will cover everybody, every Singaporean, old ones, young ones, those newly born, even those who are now outside the MediShield network. We will bring them back in. You may be elderly, you may have dropped out, you may have pre-existing illnesses. We will bring you back in. It may cost you a bit more, but it can be done. There will be no more opting out from MediShield. Thirdly, MediShield Life will give you better protection for very large hospital bills. The patients will pay less out of pocket or out of their MediSave. I think the burden on the children, on the families will be less. So three key things on MediShield Life. One, it's for life. Two, it's universal for everybody. Three, it gives you very better cover for very big hospital bills. But because it does more, because the benefits are better, therefore the MediShield Life premiums will have to be higher. Has to be, because it has to break even. And I think for most people that will not be a problem, but for a few that could be a problem, and for those who cannot afford, the government will subsidise these MediShield Life premiums for them. This is a very, very major step. We've thought about it long and hard, we've argued it, we've decided we need to do it. But how exactly to design the scheme I think we need to take some more time. And we need consult, get views. So we're going to do a public consultation, seek views before we decide on the details of the scheme. And it'll take a year, maybe more than that. But I think it's important that we try and get this started right because it's a very important step towards providing people protection and assurance that medical care you can be taken care of. And one group which we need to take special care of is our pioneer generation. They are special. They are the ones who worked hard to build today's Singapore. The generation of independence, 60s, 70s, 80s, they made this place. They enabled us today to enjoy these facilities. They earned less than us. They had fewer safety nets when they were working, they brought up this generation. And they paved the way for us to live a better life than themselves. That was their goal, they achieved it, and I think we should know that, and we should be grateful to them. Now, mostly they are retired, at least in their late 60s, many older. And we must take special care of this pioneer generation in their golden years. We've recognized them and given them something extra. Every time we've had a bonus exercise, a scheme, Minister for Finance, each time we design a scheme, we distribute something for the senior citizens, the pioneer generation, something extra. Whether it's home care subsidies, whether it's GST vouchers, whether it's a resilience package, we make sure that they are treated different. And I think in these new healthcare arrangements, we will likewise make sure that they are well taken care of. So we'll have a special pioneer generation package to help pay for the premiums for this group under MediShield Life. Make sure that our pioneer generation will be well covered and will not need to worry about healthcare in their old age. I think we owe it to them. What I've talked about on healthcare so far is what the government is doing. But there's always that aspect which the individual must do 
we each have to take personal responsibility for ourselves, both financing and also just looking after our health. We are going to spend more on healthcare year by year. The government subsidies are going up, will go up some more, but some part of it has to be paid by ourselves, and each of us must save enough to pay for our share. Therefore, I think you can guess what my next line will be. Medisafe rates have to go up. It has to be. We will increase these contribution rates over time, as and when our economic conditions permit. How, how much, we will have to discuss carefully, but the direction is quite clear. We need to save more, and that will stand us in good stead, because one day we'll all grow old, if we are lucky. But the best way for us generally to keep healthcare costs down is to stay healthy, and especially for older people, because for older people, exercise isn't just keeping fit, keeping well, but also making friends, having the social contacts, the networks, the mutual support, somebody who can keep an eye on you to say, are you all right? Something's not quite right with you. Your walk has changed. You're not quite so steady. You're stuttering. Please see the host doctor. And that is an important part of keeping old folks well. And I think the wellness program, the active aging program, which Boon Heng has been uh, pushing and is still pushing, has been making a big difference in this. I met one group recently when I went to Dalan Basar. Uh, I went to Geelang West CC, and there was a cheerobics group there. These old people. What is cheerobics? Cheerleading plus aerobics. Cheerleading is something which usually teenage young people do at football games, prancing around and throwing people up in the air. But old folks can do cheerobics too. Let's see. Older than most of us, but I think dancing and prancing around faster and better than most of us too. The third major shift which we will make is to do more to keep paths upwards open to all, wide open to all. Keeping paths wide open has been a fundamental principle for Singapore for a very long time. It's how we've enhanced our human potential, how we've created hope for every Singaporean. And it's especially true in education. And that's why we've invested in preschool, adding 20,000 places in the next five years, as I said just now in Chinese. That's why we are going to contribute to EduSave accounts of every child between the age of 7 and 16, whether they are madrasa students, homeschoolers, overseas students, which I said in a Malay speech. These are signals that we value every child and that we want to give every person the best possible chance to start off well in life. Education is a big concern for parents and students because it plays a big role in shaping one's potential and opportunities in Singapore. Parents know that they want the best for their children. And therefore, when it comes to key education milestones, these are high-stress moments for the whole family. Whether it's P1 admission, whether it's PSLE, the whole family gets involved. There are two different perspectives on education, on schools in Singapore. One is the MOE perspective. Every school is a good school. Whichever school you go to, whichever class or principal you have, you will get a good education. And we give every school the teachers, the resources, the backing. We help many of our schools develop niches of excellence. We make sure that the whole system is of a high standard. Every school is a good school. But parents and students have a different perspective. They accept the MOE argument, but they still have strong preferences for certain schools. 
And even within the same housing estate, two, different, two separate schools, a few hundred meters apart, parents will go to great lengths to bring their children into school A instead of school B. And I see it every year when it comes school admission time, after the PSLE exams, when people come and try very, very hard. Having got a place in a good school, they want a place in another school which, in their view, will be better for their kid. Sometimes they succeed, sometimes they don't. But the belief is very deep. And nationally, that happens too. Because secondary schools admit students from across the country and based on the academic results. So the result of parents looking for what they think are the best school and consulting websites like kiasuparents.com <laughs> I'm, I'm past that point, but I haven't reached kiasugrandparents.com yet. <laughs> but the result of that is certain top secondary schools get a very high concentration of the very good students, or at least the students with the very good results. So in these top secondary schools, standards are very high, competition is very intense to get in, and everybody feels enormous pressure. So you have these two views. One, MOE, every school is a good school. Two, parents, I prefer school A to school B. You ask me, what's my take? Let me tell you my take. I believe we can make every school a good school, and we have done a lot of that to ensure that every school provides a good education for the students. We give them the resources, we give them the good teachers, we emphasize values, and we've made a lot of progress towards this goal. MOE, I asked MOE for some examples. They gave me two examples, both from Bukit Bato. I think the MP will be pleased. But the first one is Bukit View Primary School, where children perform drama to develop their confidence and they put on performances. The second one is Hillgrove Secondary School, where they do flight and aerospace education. And this thing which you see buzzing around, this is one of the super light uh, kites with, helic with propellers which sometimes come put on a show at National Day. So every school is a good school. And I push MOE very hard to give the schools the resources, the good principles, the flexibility, the authority to teach students according to their students' needs to make their system work. And it's a philosophy which is not just for schools, but even post-secondary levels. You look at this ITE campus, $500 million of investments. $500 million. Passionate lecturers, high-quality programs. Therefore, students proud of themselves wanting to be here, confident that beyond this, there are many possibilities in life. So we want every school to be good. But I'm a realist. I accept that parents and students will always carefully choose which schools to go to. And I think it's good that parents compare and choose schools because it puts pressure on the schools to know that the parents are watching and that it makes a difference how they perform. But it's important that parents compare and contrast and choose on the right basis. Not just examination grades, but also how well the schools are really educating their children. Because you may have good grades because your children happen to be bright, but you may not be doing anything from them. They may be just educating themselves. You may have children who are not so naturally talented, but good education, you improve their performance, you make a big difference to them. So the quality of the schools, academically, in terms of character education, in terms of civic education, in terms of developing the students' interests, if the parents are comparing schools like that and choosing schools like that, then I think we have the right incentives and it will work. What about top schools? I think it's also good that we have top schools nationally, schools which are acknowledged as outstanding, so long as we keep our system open. The system has to be open, meaning there cannot be barriers to entry. 
outstanding students must always be able to make it to the top, to get into these institutions, and you cannot have a close, self-perpetuating elite. I'm here, my children are here, you're not in this magic circle, you can't come in. Some societies become like that, we must never become like that. We must have many pathways in our system, an open system, so students can come in, if they don't fit, they go out. If later on they develop, they could come in. There are many other points you can come in, depending on your performance, depending on your ability. If you have this, we have a high base, we have peaks, and you have a landscape. Many peaks of excellence, and there's pressure on raising standards across the board. We give good education to all our children. We can uplift the whole education system. If we have a completely flat and featureless system, every school is exactly the same as every other school, no difference, you will have not excellence, but mediocrity. In the old days in, the chi in China, they used to have that. You would be so-and-so city, school number 37, and the next one is school number 38. And what is the difference? Just a number, everything else is the same. Nobody makes the effort. Today, in China, they have a very complicated landscape. They have experimental schools. They have elite institutions. It's a socialist society, but the schools compete. Our schools, we make sure all of them are good, but all of them have to keep on competing to be good. We have an excellent education system, but our society is getting more stratified. Competition is intensifying amongst our students. And the focus, unfortunately, I think, is too much on examination performance, not enough on learning. It's very hard to fight these forces because parents want the best for their children and they think the examination results is what makes a difference. But I think we need to recalibrate to keep our system open and to focus on things which matter more than exam grades in the long run. But the education system is a very complicated and delicate machinery. You can say what you like or don't like about it. You can't just push it and expect it to become better. You must find the right spot, fine-tune, make the precise adjustment, and then watch carefully to see whether it's become better. So I'm proposing to make four small adjustments, which I will tell you about tonight. Starting at P1, admissions. P1 admissions is a complicated process. You've got phase 1, phase 2, 2A, 2B, 2C, and so forth. And it gives priority to siblings, to children of alumni, to the school community. For a reason, because we want each school to develop its traditions, its history, its identity, we want the school to have a community which cares for it. We want the school to be proud of itself, to have to know where it has come from, and to feel that, you know, when I wear the uniform, there's a history behind this. I come from Nanyang. Nanyang Nujong goes back a long way. I come from Catholic High. That means something. And likewise with so many other schools. And I think we want to preserve this. But at the same time, we don't want our primary schools to be closed institutions. And you can only get in if your parents had been there. In the past, even popular primary schools usually would have places available for children who didn't have any connection with the school. But over time, the number of places for these unconnected children have shrunk. And you can see it in this year's P1 registration exercise quite a number of schools have had to ballot earlier in the process, which means for the later phases, there are already no more places left. And if we do nothing, one day these schools may have no places left at all for those who have no connections, which I think will be bad. So we've got to strike a balance. The alumni would prefer us to keep their system. The public, they have different views. OSC discussed this. The participants proposed solutions. One says, give absolute priority to those who are living nearby. Which is fine if you happen to be living nearby the school you want to go to. 
or you can afford to buy a house nearby the school you want to go to. But it is not such an ideal system if you take it across from a system point of view. Somebody else said, do away with all these priorities. Flatten it out. 100% balloting. Just have racial quotas to make sure every school is mixed. 100% balloting. We'll be back to the school number 37, 38, or 99. And I suppose you'll wear school uniforms and you'll put the number on them. I don't think these extreme solutions will work. And anyway, whatever solution you make, parents will find ingenious ways to maximize their chances. For example, one mother moved house four times to give her older children a better chance to get into the primary schools. In Chinese, they say, Meng Mu San Qian. This one outdoes Meng Mu San Qian was Meng Zi's mother who moved home three times because her neighbors were unsuitable. So finally moved to a place where her neighbors were suitable and Meng Zi can grow up properly. Here, the neighbors were perfectly suitable. Her <laughs> mother is looking for a place to get into the right school. Four times outdoes Meng Zi's mother. <laughs> Some couples split up. Two of us, handphones, instant communications. You go to school A, I go to school B. Update each other in real time. Is it balloting? How many? What are the chances? Where shall I put my name in? It becomes a military operation. <laughs> so I think we need to strike a better balance. And from next year, every primary school will set aside 40 places at least for children who have no prior connection with the school in primary one. And we'll give every Singaporean child a chance to enter the primary school of his choice. Doesn't mean we will be able to accommodate everybody. There may be a scramble and you'll have to ballot for these 40 places. But at least the school will be open. It will never become completely closed. But at the same time, we are continuing to upgrade the quality of every primary school. And MOE has asked me to say this again, and I say it with conviction. We are doing this. You can take it on faith from me that I'm going to invest in all of the schools, and whichever school your child gets into, we're going to try and do our very best for him or her. The second small thing we are going to do is something about the PSLE, the scoring system. The PSLE is one of our most important exams, or at least many parents think that the PSLE is one of our most important examinations. Because it's not just a report of the student's performance in primary school, but parents think that determines the student's future. I just had an email from somebody who wrote to me to say, please be very careful when you touch the PSLE. Because the problem is not the exam. The problem is that parents think that the exam counts everything in the world. And if you go to this stream, you're in this fixed for life. If you go to that stream, you're fixed for life. If you go there, well, you're set for life. So that is the problem. So I replied to him, I said, no, I don't agree that that is how our education system works, but I shall be very careful. He replied to me again, he says, no, I don't agree that's how the education works either, but that's how parents think, and therefore we have to be cognizant of that and we have to take that into account. And I think we must do that. But whatever it is, because of all this, because of the way the parents think, there's a tremendous stress when it comes to the PSLE exam. The whole family takes the examination. <laughs> I knew that people went on leave for PSLE, but I watched a snippet on Mediacorp recently, and this mother said she actually stopped work for the whole year to take the PSLE with her daughter. What do we do? OSC I asked, what did the OSC people say? OSC people, one group said, one group went into this, came back, reported. Said, we discussed this at length. 
We don't like the existing system at all. We looked at all sorts of alternatives. We couldn't agree on an alternative which was a better way to post the students to secondary schools. So recommendation finally, please don't change the PSLE system. <laughs> but I think we should make some careful changes to the PSLE system. Just to put this in perspective, the PSLE, everybody thinks it matters heaven and earth. But I don't know what my PSLE grade is. I think many of you who are my age don't know what your PSLE grade is either. Because when I took the PSLE back nearly 50 years ago, in fact, 50 years ago in 1963 already, the scores were confidential. MOE never told anybody the scores. The students were only told whether they had passed or they had failed and which school they had been posted to. So we were all gathered in the car park in Nanyang, waiting anxiously while the teachers went through the list and tallied up who passed, who failed, and then came out after a very long wait and told us who passed, who failed. And luckily, I passed. <laughs> but today, it's different. Today, everybody knows his T-score. Not just everybody knows his T-score, everybody knows his friend's T-score and his friend's son's or daughter's T-score. And when they meet, they compare notes. Says, how much did your daughter get? Wow, 230, not bad. Uh. Can get into this school or not? And what about him? Did you hear that one went to 180? Wow, don't know what happened. <laughs> it happens. So I don't think it's a good thing. One point difference in the PSLE score, 230 versus 231, may make all the difference in your secondary school posting. But at the age of 12, one examination, four papers, and you want to measure the child to so many decimal points and say, wow, this one got one point better than that child, it's a distinction which is meaningless, too fine to make. Who is going to grow up abler, more committed, more capable, better contributor to society? At the age of 12, you can guess, you cannot tell. Certainly, you cannot tell based on one point difference. And I don't think we should decide secondary school postings based on such fine distinctions. So, we will score PSLE differently. We will use wider bands for grades. O levels is like that. A levels is like that. O levels, you have an A, 1, all the way down to 9, which is a fail. A levels, I'm not sure how exactly, but you also have A, B, C, D, E. But I think if we have a system of grades like that rather than precise scores, it will reduce the excessive competition to chase that last point. If you get an A star, that's an A star. It doesn't matter whether it's 91 A star or 99 A star. It's an A star and that's good enough. And you don't have to chase that last point. And then you'll be able to sit back and you have space to educate and develop the students more holistically. But what I'm talking about is what we are intending to do. It will take us some time, several years, so if you're taking the PSLE in a few months' time, <laughs> or if your son or your grandson is taking PSLE in a few months' time, please don't panic. We are not going to do anything this year. It is going to take several years to do. Next, let me say something about having more flexibility in secondary schools. We want to have secondary schools have the flexibility to tailor the education of their students to the abilities and the development of their students. Some develop faster than others. Some have interest in certain subjects more than others. Some are good at all subjects. A few are weak at many subjects. And we have to have a system which can fit each of these cases. And 
we will adapt it to that person. Already we have some flexibility between points, between PSLE to N levels or a, O levels to A levels. You can cross over. You are not fixed in one stream or one course. And we have students who have made this and transferred. For example, I, I have two young people here who have made this. I have Lim Chi Siang, who's here with us this evening. And he went from EM3, he went to a normal academic stream in Siling Secondary School. He went on to Yushin JC. And after JC, he's made it to NUS to study physics. He's now doing NS, but after NS, NUS is there. The place is there, available to him. So the system has given him the chance, the time to develop, make sure he learns properly, next stage, take a bit longer, five years rather than four in N levels. Then JC, he made good, now he's going to university. Or another example, Ahmad Mohammed bin Rosman, who had a difficult family background. He went also from, he went from EM3 to normal tech. Many people don't prefer normal tech. From normal tech, he went to ITE. ITE did a good job with him. He did well. He skipped the higher NITEC course. He's entered Singapore Poly, and he's doing a diploma in visual effects and motion graphics. So one day, he'll help me make graphics for my presentation. So we want more people to be like them and we will create more flexible choices in secondary schools. And we'll do this progressively, and this move, what we will do, is allow secondary school, secondary one students, whichever stream you're in, you can take a subject at a higher level if you've done well in that subject in PSLE. So you may be in normal academic, but if you have done well in maths, you can do that subject at all levels when you go to secondary school. You may be in normal tech, you are done, you are good in languages, you can take languages at N level or at O level when you are in secondary school. You will have that flexibility you may be, so that you can learn each subject at the pace appropriate to you. You can build on your strengths and build up your confidence, your pride, and then you can go further and fulfill your potential. I think this is a step, a, a one step in the direction to making our system more open, more flexible. Finally, go ahead. Don't, not to cheer me, cheer the students who will now have the chances to move ahead. They deserve it. Finally, let me say something about the top schools. This is a somewhat awkward subject. We want every school to be a good school. Why are there top schools in Singapore? I think there are top schools in Singapore. It's good that we have these outstanding schools in our system. Very high standards. It's a tribute to the teachers, to students, and also to our education system. Many of these schools have long history and traditions, some even longer than Singapore's. And over time, they've produced many leaders. Leaders in the private sector, leaders in the social services, leaders in the government. They have produced not just successful people, but pillars of our society. Not the only way to do so, but a significant number of people have done so. And therefore, all the more critical that these schools should develop their students holistically and admit their students holistically and imbue the right ethos and values to them, and expose them to diverse backgrounds, to build empathy and understanding, and make sure the students stay rooted in this society which has nurtured them and invested hopes in them. Most importantly, we need to keep the admissions to the top schools open so they don't also become closed circles. Not closed because you have to have parents, but closed because you have to have perfect grades. So I think that you should take not just students with outstanding academic results, but also very good students with other special qualities. 
qualities of character, of resilience, of drive, leadership. People who can show that they can make a difference in the world. And the top schools also must make sure that students from low-income backgrounds are not put off from applying to enter for fear that they can't afford it or that they can't fit in. Because sometimes you can afford it, but if you don't feel comfortable because you feel that you know, people, your friends are talking about things which you can't afford, that you feel out of place. And I think that's bad and shouldn't happen. So we must do something more to keep this spirit of openness and to keep enhance this diversity of opportunity for admission into the top schools. What will we do? Two major things. One, the top schools, in fact all schools have a DSA program, direct school admissions program, and we will broaden the DSA categories. Now if you have you're outstanding in arts and sports, even in academics, you come in on the DSA, but we must broaden this to also take into account character, resilience, drive, leadership. And we've got to get the top schools to actively seek out such students, look for them. Some of them have scholarships for these schemes. And we've got to get, invite primary schools to suggest possible students to the schools or suggest to the students, take an interest, explore it. You don't have to go there. It's not the only way up, but if you are thinking of going there, we don't, you don't have to worry. The opportunity is there, the door is open. So one, I think we should make a big effort in this to try and bring in people with the attributes we're looking for. But secondly, I think we can do more to enhance financial assistance and bursary schemes for these schools. We have the schemes, we should enhance them substantially so that anybody who qualifies and wants to attend can confidently do so. And that way we can make sure that our top schools stay open, produce graduates who become assets to our society and are connected to Singapore and to our whole community which they belong to. And I think that is the right way forward for us to go. So these changes to our education system will help to keep our pathways upwards open to all and make meritocracy work better for Singapore. Meritocracy has to remain the most fundamental organizing principle in our society. We have to recognize people for their contributions and their effort, not for their backgrounds, not for their status or wealth or connections. This cannot be a society which is based on Quan Si. It may, must be based on your ability, your contributions. What are you giving back to this society? So at the same time, if you succeed under our system, then you must feel the duty to contribute back because you didn't do it alone. And therefore, if that works, we invest in you, you give back, then everyone will benefit from the system and will see it as fair and good for them. And ESM Go recently went down to RI for... Uh, alumni dinner, and he described this as building a compassionate meritocracy. And I think he was exactly on the point. One good example of this in action is Dr. Yo Zeeling. She's here with us this evening. I met her and I thought I should tell you about her. Dr. Yo Zeeling became blind at the age of four. She studied at the Singapore School for the Visually Handicapped. She didn't go to a brand name school. She went to Budok South Secondary School Sarangoon JC, but she had an interest in mathematics. She was good at it. She read mathematics in NUS, and she graduated with three degrees, including a PhD. In maths, I stare at a page of maths with the formulas I don't understand what's going on sometimes. But to be able to imagine it, visualize it, manipulate it, express it, that's amazing. She topped the Faculty of Science in her year. Now she's a research scientist at ASTAR and an adjunct assistant professor at NTU. And here you see her. She's operating a Braille typewriter 
and with headphones, so the headphones reading back presumably the mathematical formula which she's typing in. But she's not just a successful professional. She's volunteer, volunteering at the Society for the Physically Disabled, helping others to overcome their disabilities, which is why she richly deserved to win the Singapore Youth Award last year, where I met her. Well done, Zilin. Zilin proves that if you can, you can do well if you work hard. It doesn't matter what your circumstances are. And that is what we have to try to do to contribute back to the society and keep the system fair for all. I've described what, how the government will do more in this new balance. But for this new balance to work, we all have a part to play. The government can provide a flat, but it's up to us to make a home. The government can make healthcare more affordable, but it's up to us to take care of ourselves and one another. The government can make our education system more open, but it's up to us to seize the opportunities and realize our potential. The community will also have to do more to complement the individual efforts and the government's programs. And the community is alive and well in Singapore. We saw it during the recent haze. We had young people like Sylvester Yeo, who donated his own money to provide N95 masks for elderly cleaners and hawkers. We had taxi drivers who bought and distributed masks to one another so that taxis could continue to operate. And we have grassroots efforts to deal with day-to-day -day issues. I found, came across one example recently in Siglap, Loyang Villas, which is a private estate, where Dr. Maliki, who is the MP, worked with them to solve a problem. They had a problem of indiscriminate parking, which I think many private estates have. So they had a dialogue. Dr. Maliki encouraged them to come together and work out a solution among themselves. So the residents set up a task force to study the problem and discuss what could be done. And the task force produced a code of conduct for responsible parking. <laughs> code of conduct. Item number two. We should park at least one vehicle within our porch or driveway. Makes sense, right? Item number three. We should not place objects to choke parking spaces. <laughs> so, hence you see the dustbins down there, I presume now removed. Uh, they saved on parking aunties, and maybe the other estates can learn something from them. But I'm particularly cheered that many young people are doing good work. For example, I showed you some pictures earlier of my residents, Mr. and Mrs. Lim, Mr. Ho Ti Soon, who's 104, Madam Puranam, who's uh, selling spices at my market. How did I get those pictures? They were a PAYM project in my CC. The PAYM did a, they mobilized themselves, they went around, interviewed residents, learned their stories, took pictures of them, put up an exhibition in Teggi CC. Hansel was the photographer, and so I saw the exhibition, I decided this is what I'm going to use for a National Day Rally. Thank you very much, Hansel. Other students are more ambitious. They go overseas to do good work. Singapore Poly did a project Nepal, Never Ending Passion and Love. They went to Nepal and they did a project building classrooms for the children there. You can see it's hot and dusty, but it's a good experience for them. 
So we want to encourage more young people to build a better world and a better Singapore. You are our future. You're idealistic, full of energy and passion. Go forth, change Singapore, change the world for the better. <laughs> to help you do that, we will set up a youth volunteer corps. We will expand the opportunities for young people to do projects in our community, especially students in our post-secondary institutions, in the ITEs, in the polys, in the universities. The Youth Corps will provide resources to support you, funding to start your own projects, allowances to take, say, a term off for full-time community service, grants so after graduation you can continue serving the community. It will offer mentors to guide you, advise you, make the most of your efforts. It will match you with critical community needs, help you to make a difference to our nation. These new policies, housing, healthcare, education, are very significant shifts. They are part of our new way forward. But our ultimate destination and core purpose have not changed. We want to ensure that every Singaporean shares in the nation's progress. We want to support the less fortunate and the vulnerable. We want to create opportunities for Singaporeans to do your best and ultimately to build a stronger Singapore. It's going to take some time to work out the policies and programs and to realize this new balance between the state the community and the individual. It's going to take still more time to show results. And we will assess how our strategies, our policies and programs turn out. And then as we gain experience and as our needs evolve, we will take further steps carefully forward. We are not taking these steps because our system is bad. On the contrary, we are starting from a strong position. Whether it's housing, whether it's healthcare, whether it's education, whatever our qualms, whatever our grumbles, whatever we may gripe about it sometime, it's not perfect. But by international standards, they are, ex they are all excellent. And that is a fact. Even transport, which worries many Singaporeans, we are making progress with new buses, new train lines, with new free early morning MRT rides into the city. And even the baseline, by international comparisons, honestly speaking, not bad. And I'm glad that some people appreciate our transport system, like this couple, Mr. and Mrs. Wesley Lim. They didn't just pose in front of the ra railway carriage. Instead of a wedding limo, the MRT got them to the church on time. <laughs> and as Wesley said, the ride of our lives. Who needs an S-Class when you can have an $8 billion circle line? <laughs> so I encourage more of you to do that. Our new strategic direction will take us down a different road from the one that has brought us here so far. There's no turning back. I believe this is the right thing to do, given the changes in Singapore, given the major shifts in the world. We proceed, but let me sound a word of caution. All this is not without risk. Other countries have tried to do similar things in the past with the best intentions, but ended up with unwanted outcomes. America has the highest health care spend, spending in the world. Their outcomes are worse than many developed countries, including Singapore. Finland, comprehensive protections for workers, yet 20% of youth unemployed, despite a good economy and a good education system. It could happen to us. Therefore, 
we have to tread carefully, beware the pitfalls. We will do more for the low income, but we cannot undermine self-reliance. We will increase healthcare spending, but we cannot encourage overconsumption and unnecessary treatments. We will make the education system broader and more open, but we cannot compromise academic standards and rigour. And finally, of course, all good things have to be paid for. Yes, for now, we can afford these measures from existing revenues. In the longer term, their costs will rise, especially healthcare costs. MediShield Life and the additional subsidies, over time, the amount will grow year by year. Today, people accuse us, why are we spending so little on health care? One day, we'll be lamenting, why are we spending so much? How do we save? The risks are there. We have to realise this. We have to be prepared to pay for this, whether by raising taxes, whether by cutting back on other spending, if we want to keep the social safety nets and the programmes. We cannot saddle our children's generation with debt so as to pay for our consumption. And I think Singaporeans know this. When I posted onto the, my Facebook page what I was going to talk about at the National Day Rally, one reader commented, Julie Chin, on my wall, and she spoke absolute sense. She said, I just hope any changes are not populist ones that aim to appease the angry, entitled populace and put the burden on our kids and grandkids in the future. I would rather I have it tougher now, just so my kids will not have a heavier burden to carry later. And I think she spoke absolute sense. We are here now because our parents had it tougher and built this for us. For us to say, let's be comfortable and let our kids take care of themselves, I think that's irresponsible. We must pass on to our children a better Singapore, than the one we inherited, and we owe it to them to do so. Just as we owe what we have today to our founding generation. Dr. Go Keng Sui, another of our founding fathers, once said, we must not think of where we are as a pinnacle of achievement, but as a base from which to scale new heights. And I'm glad that our young people are up to this challenge. On National Day last week, I opened the newspaper or rather, I looked at it on my iPad, and I was greatly cheered to read a forum page letter from a young lady, 15-year-old student, Ms. Jiang Ko Lin. And she said, Singapore is not perfect, and there may be flaws, but if we don't fight to protect and build it, no one else will. It's precisely because Singapore is not perfect that my generation must remain here working to further improve it. We are all still learning, so have a little faith in our country. And she quoted Mr. Lee Kuan Yew what he said back in 1967. There is tranquility, poise and confidence in Singapore. And it's a confidence born out of the knowledge that there were very few problems which we cannot overcome. And then she ended by saying, let us not be the generation which forgets that. I think it made my day. And if our young people feel like this, then I think it's our responsibility and my responsibility to make sure that, in fact, they are able to fulfill their dreams. As the OSC participants said, to build a Singapore with opportunities, with purpose, with assurance, with community spirit and trust. A home where we celebrate many talents, like Anthony Chen, whose Ilo, Ilo Ilo film won the Cannes, Cannes Camera d'Or for best first film. My French is not very good. <laughs> or the Lions 12, who won the Malaysian Super League after 19 long years. Above all, a society where the human spirit flourishes. 
To realize these dreams, we need to do tangible things too. To build our city, to improve our living environment, to prosper our economy. And we are doing so all over Singapore. Pongol Waterway, a beautiful river for residents in Pongol and all over Singapore. Not far from Fernvale River Walk. <laughs> Jurong Lake District, an integrated town with homes, offices, and leisure by the lake. The Sports Hub, opening next April. A beautiful new st stadium to watch sports, also many facilities to play sports, whether as a professional athlete or a weekend warrior. And maybe one day I can hold my NDR there too. <laughs> These are things already happening, but beyond that, we have to plan and dream and build for the very long term. Take, for example, Changi Airport. What is Changi Airport? To travellers, an icon of Singapore. To Singaporeans, a welcome landmark telling us that we've arrived home. To me, it's a part of the Singapore identity, a symbol of renewal and change. I was one of the first passengers to use Changi Airport in 1981. In fact, I took off on a test flight before the airport opened. I was a guinea pig <laughs> to help test the airport systems. MINDEF charter flight training to some secret place. And we took off middle of the night, went through immigration, customs, search, and they picked up my knife in my hand luggage. Fortunately, it was an experiment and I kept my knife. But they were on duty, it worked. We arrived home a few weeks later, Changi Airport. Paya Lebar had moved to Changi. Changi was in full business. We found then Changi a vast improvement compared to the old Paya Lebar Airport. The control tower was especially beautiful. But Changi Airport is more than an emotional symbol. It is how the world comes to Singapore and how Singaporeans connect with the world. It's why we thrive as an international hub for business, for trade, for tourism. The airport and all the things which are connected with the airport, all the related services, they provide a lot of jobs in Singapore. I won't ask you to guess how many, but it's 163,000 jobs in Singapore. 6% of the GDP. And it's all levels of society. When air travel goes down during SARS, during a recession, taxi drivers feel it immediately, especially the taxi drivers living in Tampines and Pasiris nearby. Business is down, the queue at the airport of taxis becomes longer. But the airport is also the reason for our vibrant aerospace industry and the popularity of our aerospace courses in schools. For example, here in ITE College Central, we have an aerospace engineering course. In fact, there's a 737 outside, a real aeroplane here to train our students, avionics, airframe, aer me mechanics, engines. I posted this picture on Facebook. Somebody asked, is that real or is that a Photoshop? <laughs> I said, it's real. And it's here because we are the hub because we have Changi Airport. And we have Changi Airport today because in the 1970s, 40 years ago, Mr. Lee Kuan Yew had the vision to imagine the old RAF Changi Air Base becoming an international airport to replace Paya Lebar. And he pushed for it against the advice of experts who recommended expanding Paya Lebar, building a second runway in Paya Lebar. Can you imagine one runway in Paya Lebar already aeroplanes coming in, going out over so many houses? Two runways in Paya Lebar. But Mr. Lee said, no, study, study, study again. Got Hao Yun Chong to lead it, who pushed it and made it happen. And I think we owe it to them and we're grateful to them. So we inherited this. 
but we have also progressively expanded and upgraded Changi over the years. Now, three terminals, handling 51 million passengers last year. Can still grow some, but approaching its limits. And the business is growing. Passenger traffic is up. All over Asia, middle classes are traveling. Air travel is booming. People are going on holiday, doing business. Singaporeans are traveling all over the world. National Day weekend. How many of you were not in Singapore? <laughs> I was recently in holiday, on holiday in Japan, went to Mount Fuji. I met more Singaporeans on Mount Fuji than Jap Japanese. <laughs> Other airports in Southeast Asia are expanding to take advantage of these opportunities. KLIA, they are planning to service 100 million passengers per year. Bangkok, Suvarnabhum also aiming for 100 million passengers a year. And both of them are geographically better placed than Singapore to be the hub in Southeast Asia. Because from Europe to Southeast Asia to the Far East, whether it's Hong Kong or Japan or China, KL is nearer, Bangkok is nearer still. But we are the hub. Why? Because they are not Changi Airport. <laughs> that makes a difference. Now, the question is, do we want to stay this vibrant hub of Southeast Asia? Or do we want to let somebody take over our position, our business, and our jobs? That's our choice. Do we want to let somebody else eat our cheese? And I think we must be part of this growth, and we have to plan ahead and continually build up Changi. And we have plans to do so. Today, in Changi, we already have T1, T2, and T3. They are there, but we will keep on upgrading them. We are building a new terminal. There was a budget terminal. They said they are rebuilding a budget terminal. Next thing I knew, it became the T4. I told them it doesn't look like a budget anymore. <laughs> but the business is there. It will be good. And we have one more trick. Outside T1, we'll build something special. There's a car park there, open-air car park, since there, there since the beginning. It shouldn't still be there. We are going to replace it with what we have codenamed Project Jewel. Project Jewel, it looks like this, will expand T1, so T1 will be connected with it, as will the others but it'll have shops, restaurants, and a beautiful indoor garden. So we have gardens by the bay. This one is gardens at the airport. <laughs> Not just for visitors, but for Singaporeans too. Families on Sunday outings. Students maybe studying for exams. <laughs> Newlyweds taking bridal photos. For the longer term, we are already planning T5. T5 sounds like a terminal, but actually, it's a whole airport by itself, as big as today's Changi Airport. But connected together, so it all operates as one, two runways, third runway, new T5, doubling the capacity, starting working now, Target date, mid-2020s, 12, 15 years' time. And this is how we can stay the hub in Southeast Asia and create many more opportunities for Singaporeans. But this is just one phase. Beyond this, we have further bold plans because we are going to build a new RSF airbase and a new runway at Changi. Changi East Air Base. And why are we doing that? Because if we do that, we can move Paya Leba Air Base to Changi East. And free up Paya Leba Air Base. You look at this area, it's 800 hectares. It's bigger than Ang Mo Kyo, it's bigger than Pishan. But 
it moves out, we'll build new homes, new offices, new factories, new parks, new living environments, new communities. But in fact, it's not just these 800 hectares, because if you remove, if you move the airbase, you remove the height restrictions on a big area around the airbase, which are now constrained because you have to take off, you have to land, you have to provide safety. And that frees us to develop new exciting plans for the big chunk of eastern Singapore, going all the way down to Marina and Marina South. So you are talking about 2030 and beyond, and it won't fully happen for maybe 20, 30 years after that, because houses are built, houses don't need to be pulled down overnight. But the potential is there, we can dream. Besides Pa Leba, we also have plans for our port in Tanjung Paga. Tanjung Paga, with Brani, with Keppel, with Pasir Panjang, is one of the busiest ports in the world. Business is good, the port has been very successful, it's growing, it's reaching its limits. So we are building a new port in Tuas. Bigger, more efficient. Almost double the present capacity. And then we can stay a hub port and make sure the business stays here. And when this is done, we can move from Tanjung Paga to Tuas. Starting 2027, when the port's leases expire, and when they move to Tuas, you will free up the prime land in Tanjung Paga. And there, we can build a southern waterfront city. This is a satellite picture, so you can see it all on one screen, but there's a huge area. It's 1,000 hectares, two and a half times the size of Marina Bay, all the way from Shenton Way to Pasir Panjang, from the east all the way to the west. These are very ambitious long-term plans. It's an example of how we need to think and plan for our future. And it reflects our fundamental mindset and spirit to be confident, to look ahead, to aim high. If we can carry off these plans, we don't have to worry about running out of space or possibilities for Singapore. We are not at the limits. The sky is the limit. We are creating possibilities for the future. We are opening up opportunities for our children, for their children, to continue to build, to upgrade, to reinvent this city for many more years to come. Very few countries or cities anywhere in the world can think or plan over such a long term. But Singapore has been able to do it. This is how we got here, and this is what we must do to be here tomorrow. Next year, and for many more years to come. But in a deeper sense, these are not plans. These are acts of faith. Acts of faith in Singapore and in ourselves. Faith that a generation from now, Singapore will still be here and will still be worth investing in for the sake of our grandchildren and their grandchildren. Faith that we can thrive in the world, whatever the challenges, and hold our own against the competition. Bigger, stronger, but we are there. Faith that we can get our politics right, that we can throw up honest, capable, trusted people to lead our country well, to make our system work for Singaporeans. Faith that we can stay together as one united people, maintain a steady course year after year, and make our dreams come true. Nowhere was this faith more vividly expressed than in our National Day Parade, when we sang Majula Singapura together as a flag flew past on a helicopter, when we pledge ourselves as one united people to achieve happiness, prosperity, and progress for our nation. This year's parade showed what Singapore can do, in the stories of our fellow Singaporeans, especially those who have overcome adversity, like our wheelchair basketballers. In the faces of the participants, radiant and happy, 
thrilled to be part of this shared story in the response of the crowds. Crowds at the platform, crowds around Marina Bay, crowds before TV screens and monitors all over Singapore, in fact, around the world. Watching them, feeling them, made me and my colleagues more determined to do the best for Singaporeans. They bolstered our conviction that it's worth doing and we can do it. We may have made major shifts in our policies, but our core purpose has not changed to create opportunities for Singaporeans to fulfill their potential, do their best, to invest in every Singaporean and develop their innate talent, to keep Singapore a place where the human spirit thrives. We are not done building Singapore. We never will. Work with each other. Work with us. Together, let us forge our new way forward. Together, let us build a better Singapore for all of us. Good night. Thank you.